Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to uh, be introducing uh, DCM to you. Um, I used to be a, a postdoc a fellow with Carl and working with Peter on uh, DCM things and since then I've been um, joining the SPM faculty and it's always a great pleasure. Um, DC, the DCM talk, especially the introduction, is a little bit advanced and sometimes a little bit confusing, especially if you just started with uh, data analysis or this is your first uh, introduction into SPM. So um, it's okay if you're a little bit confused. It is directly related to the talk that you just uh, uh, heard from Chris, uh, who introduced um, uh, Bayesian ways of analyzing data. And DCM is very much a method that applies all these assumptions that you uh, that you heard about in a previous talk. Um, yeah, so uh, one note I, I would like to give also in the beginning is that the theory of DCM is quite complex and sometimes it's difficult to understand. And you will see that the application of it is much more simple the way it is um, done in SPM. And we will show you a little bit, uh, a small demo of it um, after this talk. And um, also there are practical sessions, I believe. If you signed up for DCM, then you will do um, these examples with uh, Peter and Johan that are hosting them today. I believe. Oops. Um, okay, so uh, today's topics, or, or my goal for today is uh, to give everyone at least a broad overview over what DCM is, what you can use it for, also what you should not use it for. Um, and we will look at how data is actually modeled on the single subject level for now, and um, how we estimate or invert our our model so um what the assumptions are and uh, what the process looks like and then i just mentioned this we will also have a demo and uh, see like, like well, apart from the theory uh what does the practical part look like for you just to make sure that everyone is on the same page about um connectivity when we use the word connectivity so neuro imaging there's generally three types of connectivity that people refer to. The first one is uh, structural connectivity, um, which looks for true physiological connections between um, between neurons or uh, brain regions. So here we use methods like DTI or diffusion weighted imaging to look for those tracts that um, that uh, link different parts of the brain. And then we have um, the very famous functional connectivity. Here, we don't care whether two brain regions are um, connected, but we do care about whether they somehow co-vary over time. So if their activity is um, linked, this can be positively linked. So if one region is more active, the other region is also more active. And it can also um, be that one region um, it decreases activity when another region increases uh, activity. Um, but um, functional connectivity always looks just at covariance in some shape or form. So um, it's usually we refer to it as an, as an observational uh, type of feature of your data, uh, uh, observational measures that you have about uh, your data. Well, the third type of connectivity called effective connectivity tries to explain what is going on um, in the brain and how um, activity and connectivity, functional connectivity covariance comes about. So here we want to know which brain region has an effect. So it's not just about covariant region, regions A and B, but we want to know does A have an effect on B or does B have an effect on A? or maybe there's a region C that modulates them all and, uh, and um, so on. So we have directed uh, connections and we're, it's um, some people don't like the word uh, the term causal, but we have more um, directed effects um, and very specific brain um, networks to look at. And DCM is a method to infer effective connectivity. As you will see, we make a lot of, uh, you have to have a, 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 a good idea or uh, at least an assumption on what the brain network you want to look at um, or the task you're studying um, is going to look like on the network level. Um, so the um, task that I will um, uh that we will use for the demo and also that um as part of uh we use to uh, uh on the next few slides 
is a one that has been used for, for many, many years. It is a simple matching task where uh, subjects are presented with th three stimuli and are supposed uh, are asked to match them based either on the meaning uh, of, so here they see three words um, and um, you see two trees, but uh, palm trees and pyramids usually uh, often occur together. Um, so you could match these based on the meaning of the, of the uh, word, for example, or based on perceptual features, so similar looking um, stimuli. And the stimuli can either come in the sh uh, shape of the words, as we see them here, or um, as pictures. So we have two factors uh, we want to look at. Um, and as Peter will explain later, we're cheating a little bit, trying to make this a full factorial uh, design, um, but it's a very classic task. So it's a, it's a good example for our cause today. Um, so when subjects perform the task, there's a lot of data already available. So we are quite certain we know what's going on in the brain in terms of activity. And um, let me see if I can have a pointer. Yeah. Um, so when subjects perform the task, there's four regions um, that um, are very active in the brain, um, which are two dorsal regions in the, the left frontal dorsal region and the right frontal dorsal region, and then the right uh, ventral uh, frontal part and uh, left ventral frontal part. So these are the four uh, suspects that we have um, that form a network and enable the subject to perform this matching task. And um, in terms of uh, data analysis, we uh, I just mentioned these, we have uh, two factors for each subject. So task conditions that subjects performed. And this is a typical task where uh, researchers would have uh, questions for um, their, uh, on the group level for their sample, for their whole data set. In, for example, studying um, differences in hemispheres. So some sub subjects use the left hemisphere more to perform this task, and other subjects perform uh, use the use right hemisphere more to perform this task. And um, we can ask, or we can try to use our data in a way that explains to us what is the difference in a brain on the brain network level that causes some subjects to use the left or the right um, a hemisphere more. So for that, on the group level, which I will not show you, this uh, Peter will show you, and it's also in, in, the, in the papers and the tutorials that are provided, um, there's another factor, which is lateralization. So whether a subject used the left or the right hemisphere more. This is more for information for you, so you can go back to this later and um, um, remember what the, uh, what the hypotheses are and what this task is for. Um, okay, so we have um, two types of inputs, um, but I think I will skip this and we will uh, revisit this um, when we do the tutorial. Okay, um, back to DCM. Um, when you specify a dynamic causal model, uh, what you start with is identifying the brain regions that you are interested in. So for example, for the task that we just saw, we have uh, four brain regions, um, that are relevant to perform the task, usually you will identify brain regions based on task activity. There are examples where, where you can would add um, additional regions or maybe one of your regions is less important. Anyhow, the first step is always um, to specify your brain network in terms of who are um, the members or the nodes of your network. So if we uh, choose for this example, we choose uh, four brain regions, then the next step would be um, deciding which connections might be present um, in your network. So which brain regions talk to each other uh, or affect each other in terms of their activity when um, subjects perform a task, for example. Um, uh, when we specify a model that has all connections that are possible, and remember they are directed. So here, just for um, because it's a simpler for illustration, I just use one line, but you, you would make an arrow either from the top left to the top right or from the top right to the top left. And using all connections, it's what we refer to as a full model. Um, next, you specify which brain regions receive task input. So for example, when you show uh, individuals a picture, then you would expect that the visual cortex lights up. And if subjects don't see anything, then the visual cortex does, does not light up anymore. So visual information would usually enter your network 
through um, <clears throat> the visual cortex or some other uh, brain region. Um, and um, then we need um, one um, special feature in, in, in DCM, which is the so-called self-connections. So each connection is connected to itself in the future. And we need that um, so uh, we can compute how brain regions change the activity over time. Um, so basically, so for example, the, the visual cortex, and when you see a picture, uh, will increase the activity and then it will decrease um, um, over, over time. And in order to quantify that, how sensitive a region is to input and how uh, fast it goes back to its baseline, we need those um, self-connections. And um, the last thing we specify are the so-called modulators. Um, this is usually closely related to, to, to your task and your hypothesis, uh, because here um, we specify which um, inputs change the connect uh, connections um, between brain regions. So for example, when uh, individuals are um, uh, performing a mental rotation task, then some two brain regions might work closely together as compared to when they're just matching two photo photographs or something like that. So these are called the modulators. Um, and that's it. You have already specified everything you need. And um, we write all these things down in terms of uh, vectors and matrices. <laughs> so your first um, <clears throat> matrix will be uh, a matrix U, which includes all input, where um, whether it's the driving input, the external driving input into a region, or modulating, which changes uh, the connection a strength between uh, regions, it will all be in uh, one nice matrix. And second, you specify um, the regions that are members of your network, uh, of course. So it's a vector Z that takes the length of uh, the number of regions that you have. Next question, uh, next is the matrix A, uh, which at the, uh, um, at the step where you just specify your DCM, um, it's just a matrix with zeros and ones, uh, specifying which of these connections are present. And here you can see a full model, so all the connections that are possible. Um, then we specify a matrix C, um, which um, specifies which of these regions receive which input, right? So you might have visual input in the visual cortex, auditory input in the auditory cortex, or some decision-making information through the frontal cortex um, or whatever. That will be specified in C. And then our modulators, so which of the connections that we included in, in our model, um, and these are this includes the cell includes the cells connections, which are modulated by which of your task conditions. So um, B has multiple elements and each uh, and one element for each of the uh, inputs that you specify. That's a lot right now. You will see later that it's really nicely implemented into DCM uh, into SBM, sorry, and um, very um, much easier to apply. Okay, so here we have an example of a full model with all connections present, everything is modulated by everything, and um, you see that it gets very messy very fast. And what DCM will do is it will try to fit one parameter for each of the connections and each of the modulators and each of the inputs and so on. So there will be many, many, many parameters that your model needs to fit at the same time. So you, uh, so this is, um, is is a very, very complex network that you specified, which will be very inefficient because as we see later, um, many of these connections or the modulators are not going to explain anything in your data. Um, but um, they need to be estimated, so they consume resources, so to say. And we punish models that are very complex because we need always strive for the most simple solution that best explains our data. So specifying a full model is almost never a good idea. DCM is a method to test hypothesis and not to freely explore your data. So um, usually we would not do that, but for example, we would take away some connections that are either not biologically plausible or not meaningful um, in this way, you see, and we take away some of the modulators as well. And you see, that's much nicer. And then we can also think about uh, external driving input and, and think that, oh, maybe just RI2 and RI4 receive these, um, and then uh, it's even simpler. 
it's even simpler and much less parameters. So this is a much better model in terms of its efficiency, much less parameters, less complexity. Okay. Um, now let's look at what the, um, those matrices and vectors um, look like. Um, at first we have the matrix U um, that consists of all of our inputs. And um, like I said, it, ha it has a, for one column for each of the inputs that you have. Uh, in this case, we have three inputs, even though, so this is from an example of uh, Peter's um, neuroimage paper. He has two neuroimage paper, one for subject and one for group level uh, analysis with uh, DCM. I highly, highly recommend them. Um, they, have, they have really nice um, um, introduction and explanation of everything DCM, and they could become your Bible, so you could just revisit them when you set up your first uh, DCM analysis. And I'm choosing, I'm using the same example as him. And here the task has really just two conditions. So pictures and uh, words, we're just modeling those two from the example that you saw earlier. And then we want to have one driving input. And that's a common thing that uh, people do is the, the driving input that pings brain regions into activity. is just a summary of all task conditions. So we want to know um, in terms of our modulators, just like what, from the average activity during the entire task, how did each condition regulate um, connection up and down? So we would have two modulating input pictures and words, and one driving input, the first column of you. So the matrix U has the size of the number of um, inputs you have, and then time um, in terms of uh, the number of rows that it has. Um, then we have the vector Z, which is just uh, all of your brain regions. Uh, you can freely choose the order of which uh, in which the brain regions um, go in there. Uh, as you will see in the, in the demo or in the practicals, um, choose wisely because you will be stuck with it and you will have to remember for all eternity which, or, which order you chose here. Um, then we have a matrix A. Um, matrix A specified in the beginning which connections are present um, in in your in your network, it takes the size of the number of regions by run the number of regions, and um, for example, from the viewpoint of R I uh, two, we want to have an outgoing connections to R I one. So from R I two to R I one, uh, we specify all existing uh, present connections using a one and non-existing connections using a zero. So this would be a one, and we also have a self connection from Ri two to Ri two. So this also has a has a uh, one, and then we do not want any connections to Ri three or Ri four. And so here are two zeros, and so on and so forth. So in columns, you always have the source of the effective connectivity, and in rows, you have um, the target of uh, effective connectivity for all matrices, by the way. So next we have um, the matrix B, which has um, each element has a size of A. Um, and then we have one element of B for each of the inputs. So in this case, we have three inputs and we want the first one to be um, driving input and two modulators. B only specifies the modulators. So the first column um, of our, or, the, or the first um, input that we have does get an element of B, but they're all zero, which means the task does not modulate anything. The task does, however, modulate some of the connections. So for example, from viewpoint of RI1, we want the self-connection modulated and the connection to RI3 um, and four, but not the connection to RI2. So here, first row is RI1, this is modulated, not the connection to Ri2, but yes for Ri3 and Ri4, and so on and so forth. And then there's uh, matrix C. Matrix C um, specifies which of the brain regions in rows receive your task input in columns. So um, again, columns two and three, where are modulators? So they're not driving anything. 
but we want uh, RI2 and RI4 to receive driving input, and therefore we have a one here and one here, and the other two are zero. Okay, and that's it. That's all you need to specify um, in order to describe um, what is going on on the neural level. So we have now specified our brain network, what the members are, how they are connected, and we have also specified what type of input goes into the network um, and uh, how it flows through the network in terms of connectivity, modulators, driving input, and so forth. So if you have that, you can already start predicting data. So if, if you know this about the brain, what the brain, what the brain network looks like and what it's doing, you can start predicting what brain activity would look like that you measure, right? So you could start predicting time series. Um, the problem is that we never measure brain activity. There's some methods, direct single cell recordings, but we cannot do that um, in in um, in humans, unfortunately, very rarely so. So usually we have some kind of neuroimaging method. So we have MRI, this is the um, uh, course for MRI studies. There's also EG or MEG and NEARS. And um, none of these methods actually measure brain activity. There are always some approximation um, to uh, what the brain uh, might be doing at a particular time. And um, so I've worked all my science life with MRI and I really love it, but let's face it, if you look at what we actually measure, then it's really far away from brain activity. So we measure the oxygen level in blood, assuming that brain regions that consume more blood, uh, that um, are active, need more blood because blood provides the oxygen um, that the brain needs in order to perform something. So no, we're not even measuring the oxygen level, sorry. We're measuring the different uh, physical properties of blood that has a high or low um, oxygenation. So it's the hemodynamic um, uh, effects is what we call it, right? Uh, the Bowles response. Um, yeah, so DCM takes care of this discrepancy between the true neural activity and what we might measure at the end um, by including what is called an observation model. And the observation model for MRI includes some hemodynamics. So what is the signal, uh, what are changes introduced into your signal because you're using uh, MRI and then some uh, MRI specific parameters like scan and drift and stuff like that. Um, and um, includes a specific set of parameters just to take care of that. And then we always add uh, what is called a measurement model, which is basically just modeling some um, um, known and unknown noise. Um, and the observation model is, uh, there are standard observation models available for all sorts of things you might want to do uh, using DCM, but you, you're free to also uh, make your own um, if that's your jam. Yeah, so we will be left with um, um, three sets of parameters, the neural model, um, the observation model or hemodynamic model for fMRI um, and uh, the measurement model, which is just modeling error. And the summary of these is called the forward model because we have now solved the forward problem because we uh, specified the brain network and uh, the inputs to it. We have specified how we measured it so we can, um, we can quite surely say what sort of time series we are going to see, right? But in science, uh, we usually have um, the uh, backward problem. So we don't have the forward problem. We want to predict time series. No, we already measured something. We already know this is ground truth that the brain was doing this and that. And um, our question is more, um, what sort of um, parameters in our brain network would explain this sort of data that I have already seen? So the forward problem asks, what is given that I have a specific model and certain parameters, standard parameters, uh, what is the type of data that I will see or what will be the likelihood for a specific uh, sets of data? So that's the forward problem. What we want to know in science though is given I have seen this data and I have a particular network architecture model, what are the optimal parameters that explain this sort of data? 
So we have the inverse problem, um, and we need to fit the parameters uh, of our model to the data. And that is why the estimation step of such models, of such forward models, is call, uh, called model estimation, but also model inversion, because we basically flip the question, right? Um, let's look at that in terms of um, equations. Um, so our signal is basically uh, split into two parts neural sources and non-neural sources. So the neural sources say that the state of regions or um, changes in the activity um, of a region are a function of previous states of that region, some uh, input uh, and neural the neural parameters that we specify. And the non-neural sources, so final data is a function of the, uh, this is the hemodynamic model of the true state of the region, and the hemodynamic uh, parameters, because that's how we measure it, the true quote unquote um, activity. And then we have some known um, and unknown noise, such as the mean of the signal and the um, uh, random error. Um, uh, to estimate our um, uh, any state of our region in terms of the matrices that we have. Um, um, learned about a few slides ago, uh, we have uh, neural state changes um, are a result of the average state of that region, so matrix uh, A, and some modulators of that average activity um, due to um, modulating input, plus um, some driving input directly into um, certain brain regions. And if we blow this up for the whole network, uh, we arrive at what is called the bilinear state equation. That is not something you might see in papers that uh, explains how um, parameters are estimated, which states the same thing. Any state changes in the network are a result of the connectivity in that network and some modulation of that connectivity plus direct inputs um, into brain regions. And that's bilinear because uh, we can calculate this um, state equation for regions being switched on or off. Okay, so um, for almost all models, um, we will estimate multiple parameters. So in theory, there are multiple values that those parameters could take that could almost equally good explain your data. Right. So the question is, how do we decide which sets of parameters is the best um, set for uh, for uh, our current data? And we do that using Bayesian inference, which starts with uh, and, and in Bayesian inference, we quantify, as you learned earlier, um, we quantify the uncertainty that we have um, for um, a given model and some some observations. This starts with specifying priors. So each of your parameters will get a prior value. And um, the first major difference is if you uh, switch on a connection. So if you say this connection might be present um, in, my, um, uh, in my brain network, then this um, parameter will receive a starting value. It's usually zero or some other value depending on what model you use. Um, and then you give it a variance of non-zero, which means this parameter can then, at the step when you estimate the model, uh, move somewhere here. So it can take a different value in parameter space around its starting value. And we will now uh, we will um, see in a second that how far it moved away from its prior is something we use to specify how complex this model is, so how expensive it is, basically. If you switch off a connection, it's not a drop from, from your, your network. It just means it's receiving a starting value of zero um, and a variance of also zero. So this parameter cannot move. So it means we're, we're specifying this connection doesn't do anything and we are highly certain that that is true. Okay, it will not be estimated, it will not um, um, be expensive. So what we want to do now is find the model that best explains our data. Um, so we want to, in other words, maximize the evidence that we have seen this data given our model, right? We cannot measure this directly, 
Um, but we can use an approximation um, that is called negative variational free energy. Um, we can remember that or not. Uh, we will make Carl happy if we do. Um, nothing bad happens if you don't. <laughs> um, yeah, and that approximation um, basically uh, gives you a value called the free energy value, which specifies how accurate you predicted the data, how, how well the model performed, and punishes um, each um, different set of parameters by their complexity. So how many um, parameters did you have in your model? How far did they have to move away from their prior? So how expensive was it to estimate this model? And uh, we compare different models um, by this um, um, model evidence. So for each model, you compute the accuracy and the complexity, and you compare uh, two models, and also you find the optimal set of parameters by comparing uh, the free energy or the model evidence of uh, different competing models, in this case I, a case I or, or J, which is and a comparison between uh, two uh, models is called the Bayes factor. And um, on a side note, which I find very important because uh, you will be asked this often, um, especially from people who are uh, not used to leaving the realm of linear statistics to analyze their data. So they will ask you, um, how did you take care of over or underfitting your data? Um, and just super quickly uh, to explain what overfitting um, is, it's a, it's a problem in, when specifying models for data. So ideally, so if these black spots are our data, ideally we want to find some sort of explanation that nicely explains everything. Here we make like a few errors. So every um, distance from the curved line to each spot is like the error we made. So we made a little error here and a little bit here, but overall we described the data really good. We could also find a much simpler solution, just a linear line, but we make a lot of error. So we don't, uh, we don't, our uh, linear line doesn't go through any of the uh, dark spots anymore. Um, and we make a lot of errors. So this is underfitting. We, 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 we have a simple model, but we don't explain anything very well. Or we could use uh, include a bunch of uh, parameters more um, in our model and perfectly describe everything. Look, we're going through every data spot we have. So technically, you could have one parameter per data point that you include um, in your analyses. Um, but this is very inefficient and it's also very unmeaningful because uh, you will never be able to use this model for any kind of data again. So it doesn't really explain anything that's generally going on in the brain. It just explains this very specific data set very good. And we'd, um, this needs to be avoided at all costs. Um, and um, DCM has this built in basically because we use priors and because because we use model evidence. So um, so by the, um, the the number of parameters and the use of priors, which limits the movement of our parameters, we can already um, uh, we already uh, prevent uh, overfitting and we kick out the models that don't explain our data uh, very well. So underfitting as well. All right, um, that was uh, the introduction part, the theoretical part of it. There's some uh, um, papers and resources. Um, I would like to recommend, uh, first of all, uh, Peter's neuroimage papers. They're uh, written so clearly, so lovely. All the details are in there. You can go back and look at all the settings they can do for, um, uh, for DCM. So there's one paper for uh, the subject level DCM, one paper for the group level P DCM, both of um, them are on his uh, GitHub page, uh, along with all the data that we're using today. So maybe you received this link already, I'm not sure, but highly, highly recommended um, read. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>